I am here today to tell you about the three-minute thesis competition that I, as Dr. Ingram said, I participated earlier this year at Ohio University. The three-minute thesis was created in 2008, and it's actually being held at around 200 universities around the globe. So this is a very popular thing, and as such, Ohio University has planned and is planning on holding this competition every year from now on. So this is great because you can all participate when you reach your final year as either a master's or a PhD student. So the rules of the competition are pretty simple. You have three minutes to explain your thesis to a general audience, and you are allowed to have one PowerPoint slide to go along with what you're trying to say. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to present my three-minute thesis to you right now. And afterwards, I will spend a few minutes sharing some thoughts and considerations that I had when I was actually trying to write the speech and uh, make the slide to go along with it. The universe has approximately 100 billion galaxies. To put this huge number into context, there are about 100 billion hairs on the heads of all the people in Columbus, Ohio. Nearly every smudge you see in the background here is a galaxy. If you look closely, you see that galaxies come in many different shapes, sizes, and colors. Why do galaxies look different from one another? Galaxies look different because they change over time. Astronomers have stared at many images of galaxies from many different time periods, and they found that young galaxies look in a certain way, but old galaxies look different. How does a galaxy change its appearance? One way a galaxy changes is by going through an active phase. Here is a picture of an active galaxy, and you can see a bright light in the center. This light has about the same brightness as 100 billion suns. What is causing so much light to come out of the center of an active galaxy? This is what we think the center of an active galaxy looks like. In the middle is a black hole. The orange is gas falling toward the black hole, just like things fall toward the Earth. This orange gas produces the bright light in the centers of active galaxies. What else do black holes do other than make stuff fall toward them? Black holes can also drive gas back into the galaxy in the form of a wind, which is shown here in blue. This process is just like an engine, which needs gas to make a car drive away. Is it possible that these winds travel out into the surrounding galaxy and change the galaxy's shape, size, and color? This is the question that my dissertation seeks to answer. To understand whether black hole winds affect galaxy evolution, I measure these winds by looking at them with a telescope. Telescopes today can collect the light from a galaxy and split it into a rainbow, just like you see here. This is very important because the rainbows coming from these active galaxies have dark lines in them and these lines hold precious information about the black hole winds. I measured the dark lines and the rainbows of about 100 active galaxies to gain insight into the black hole winds. I found that some of these winds are capable of changing a galaxy's shape, size, and color, but not all of them. Nevertheless, the fact that we have established that some black hole winds are responsible for changing part of a galaxy's life is very exciting and will allow us to further explore black holes in the centers of galaxies and their important role in our universe. Thank you for listening. So now that you have a better idea of how this process sort of works with the three-minute thesis, I'd just like to take a few minutes to talk about some of the things that I thought about when I was actually making this speech. So remember that the main goal here is that you want to make your research accessible to a general audience. So these are people that have likely or may not have taken physics classes before in their life. So that's something that I thought about and tried to make my speech and slide as clear as possible with that in mind. So the first thing that I'd like you to consider is, and it's something that I considered, is how do I figure out how to actually structure the speech? What do I figure out and how do I, how do I figure out what to say and during this three minutes? It's not a lot of time. So, the approach that I took was to first start out with the big picture. What is the biggest idea that the audience can relate to? Because uh, you need to place your research into the broader context that people can understand. So in the case of what I just told you, the biggest idea that I could think of was the universe has a bunch of galaxies. So it's pretty big, right? And so having established the big picture, 
what I thought was to think of these smaller, more focused ideas to lead the audience from the big picture to actually what you do in your dissertation. So in this example, the universe has a bunch of galaxies. Galaxies change over time. One way that galaxy changes is be going, uh, going through an active phase. Active galaxies have black holes in them. Black holes make these winds come out. And then comes the question, do black hole winds make galaxies change? So you get, the, you get the idea behind this. This is not the only way to do this. There are many ways to do this. But I think that the two most important things that, um, that should happen is that you first need to have a big picture. You have to establish a context for people uh, so that they can understand what you're saying. And the other thing is you have to have a punchline for what you're actually doing in your dissertation. And then you can just sort of connect the dots from there. Um, Actually, one of the difficulties that I found when I was actually going through this process of writing the speech was it's very difficult to ignore the details of your research. Um, what I mean is it's very difficult to only focus on what's important during the three minutes. So the problem is, is that what we do from day to day, we do all these computations, we do all these, um, we fiddle with the data, we fiddle with the simulations. In my opinion, none of that matters in a speech like this. The things that do matter are the things we never think about, which are the big ideas with how our research fits into the broader picture. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, very related to the first thing, is how do you make the slide? What do you put on the slide? And how do you make it sort of match up with what you're trying to say? So you can see the example slide over here. And I still have the example. Um, and I took the same approach. I started out with the big idea. I thought of smaller ideas to go from the big idea to the dissertation. So in the example, again, big picture, universe has a bunch of galaxies. If you look at the slide, you see a bunch of galaxies in the background. And you can also see that this background takes up most of the space. I thought that was a good idea because it's a, it's a very large emphasis placed on it as a result. And it's, your, it's the big idea that you have. And what I did from there was, I created these smaller panels that lead from the big picture to the dissertation. So I have a picture of an active galaxy. You can see the bright light in the center that I referred to. Um, the black hole in the center of the active galaxy, we have a representation of that. And these blue winds that I represent in blue coming out. And we can actually measure these winds, which is what I do every day. I just look at the rainbows and I measure them. And that's sort of what I represented for what I actually do in the dissertation. So in this case, I found it difficult to know how much writing and text to put on the slide. And I think this is difficult because there's always an urge to put more text than you have to. And the thing to remember is that you only have three minutes. If you put a lot of text, the people won't focus on what you're saying. They might be inclined to read what you're um, saying in the slide. And it might get a little confusing. So I went with the minimal approach. I tried to place as many, as few words as possible on the slide, just the absolute necessary words, and tried to match, the, have the slide mimic exactly what I'm saying. So again, you can go the other direction, though. If you put too few uh, words, you might actually lose the audience. So it's kind of a, it's a trade-off, and it's something that I would just want you to think about. And finally, the last thing that I thought was very important was what words and phrases to choose when you're actually giving the speech. So there are two things that I thought about here. The first is I wanted to think about words that actually made sense to keep, words that the audience will likely understand. And again, we're talking about a general audience, so these are not physicists in general. So I've listed a few examples of words that I uh, said during the speech. First one, black holes. Black holes are great. Black holes are part of society. We all know about black holes. They're, um, they're wrote about in the news. They're on the movies. They're part of science fiction. Black holes is a perfect example of what should be kept in a speech. And you don't really need to explain black holes because everybody knows what they are. Other examples, galaxies, universe, telescope. Again, in my opinion, these are all words that people will likely understand. And therefore, you can keep them. Some other examples that are more difficult were words that scientists would understand, but maybe the general audience might not understand. So what I did in these examples was I took the word in question, 
I chose a different word that had the same meaning and tried to think of the, word, the best choice of word that would actually convey the point and people, the most people could understand. So uh, what I mean is on the first column you can see words that I actually said and on the second column words that I actually mean when I'm talking to somebody like a physicist. So the first example is rainbow. That's what I said but what I actually mean is spectrum and you all know what a spectrum is but again somebody that hasn't taken science might not. So that's sort of the idea. Uh, second example, dark lines. What I really mean is absorption lines, but again, somebody might not know what absorption lines are. And I think that dark lines sound very mysterious and magical, so I thought that was a good choice. <laughs> Third example, gas falling toward the black hole. What I really mean is accretion. Again, same sort of story. I'm trying to choose phrases that actually can convey a clearer point for people that might not know what accretion is. So, uh, a final difficulty that I had was knowing how much to explain when I'm going from one idea to the next. And this, I feel, is probably the most difficult in the three-minute speech. And it's because if you spend too much time on any single idea, you don't give yourself enough, enough time to sort of progress through your whole story. Um, on the other hand, if you don't give them enough information from each idea to the next, you'll probably lose the audience. So that's something to consider if you're thinking about participating is you need to figure out how big of a leap you want to go from one idea to the next and you, the audience might still be with you, hopefully. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say about this. The final thing that I'll say is that I think this exercise is very useful for us graduate students. We spend most of our time doing research during the PhD and we have very little opportunities to communicate our research to the general public. So I strongly encourage everyone to consider participating in this competition for that reason. Thank you.